This is FE Peer Review. The date is April the 3rd, 2023. Do numbers exist? And let's play definition games. I got the idea for this video when I was watching a video by Paul Logia. This is a talking points video. I just wanted to share with you a thought and I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments. Paul Logia is a former Christian who is no longer a Christian now, calls himself an atheist, and who reviews of uh, videos by Christian apologists. In this case, he is reviewing a video of a certain pastor. And now the purpose of this video of mine is not uh, to discuss religious topics, but there was a very excellent comment in Paul Logia's video that I thought was a great example of just really clear-headed thinking, a well-structured uh, statement of the idea, and then some good examples. And I just thought it was an exemplary example. <laughs> of uh, clear thinking how to how to put ideas together and I wanted to share it with you all but in order to provide some context I'm going to give you a minute or so here of Pologia's original video also next question is what do you mean by exist because of course where this is going to be going is do non-material things exist and one can ex imagine already well he's going to come up with things like numbers or categories Things like that. Do numbers exist? Do they not exist? This is really a debate between nominalism and realism. And there are two divided philosophical camps on this as to whether abstractions like numbers, for example, exist. I happen to be in the nominalist camp. I do not think that abstractions exist in any meaningful way of the word exist. I understand some philosophers disagree. The whole point here is, though, that if this is supposed to be therefore a God at the end of the conversation, you need this to be a much more clear cut, broadly accepted premise that Eric is going to pitch here that non-physical abstract objects exist. That is unclear. So the best you could get is maybe God, but he's not going to walk us all the way there. Spoiler. He said, yeah. So this is the comment and we're talking about the supposed existence of non-physical things. This is what she's responding to using the example of numbers. And she is Violet H. I'm going to assume she, just, she is a she, since my aunt is named Violet. So here's a comment. Numbers are functionally adjectives that describe the quantity of their associated noun. Like all other adjectives, they identify a quality held by an entity or entity that at least hypothetically exists and do not themselves exist or hypothetically exist. This is an incredibly obvious conclusion when looking at a word problem or problem that assigns units to the numbers. All a purely math problem does is hand wave the units, assuring the one solving it that the arbitrary units that could have been assigned will work out without issue. Example, no adding two inches to three lumens. Adding one and one to get two isn't adding a one and another one to get a two. It's adding one thing and another one of that thing to get two of that thing. We just generally cut the units out of the statement for the same reason we don't feel the need to say the name of whomever we say hello to. It's implied and people intuitively get that. Thank you, Violet. I thought that was a great comment because you really spelled it out so clearly. You started with the definition and your definition is totally unambiguous, very clear. And then you provided us with relevant examples. That's the way to do it. Now let's take a look at another comment and we're going to see how you can play loose with definitions and what happens when you do that. Before we move on to the definition game. Again, I want to provide a little context. We're going to need about two minutes of Paul Logia's video, so we will dive into that now. Take the mind and brain. Are they the same thing? No, your thoughts are not in your brain, they're in your mind, but your mind uses your brain like a guitarist would use a guitar. The wow, that is not. That's just straight up substance dualism, and that is not concluded by any means. Mostly that is a religious belief, but that's the idea that there's some substance out there driving our brain. Now, if that was actually true, eventually someday we're going to discover this mechanism by which this consciousness or the mind, which is entirely separate from the brain, 
What's the mechanism by which it's using our brain to fire neurons, to have electrical impulses, to, to make all this stuff happen? Because undeniably, our brain is driving our body. There's no reason to think that something outside of the brain is necessary for any of these things. So his just declaration that those are things, that is an assertion that we would need citation for, my friend. Notes of the guitar are not in the guitar. You don't break the guitar and the notes fall out. Same thing with the minor brain. But let's okay. So he used the guitar as an example. The notes of the guitar aren't in the guitar. And he's trying to say that that's the same way thoughts and the mind are in the brain. Now, first, he's actually trying to get to the idea that thoughts aren't physical. And perhaps he's trying to also play on the idea, for someone who hasn't thought about it very well, that notes aren't physical. But are notes physical? What are notes? Notes are sound waves in the air. It needs a medium. There's no sound in space where there isn't air, a physical medium by which to transmit those things, right? So by that way, sound is physical. And we know that the guitar string, when you pluck it, it ends up creating the proper necessary vibrations in the air. So a note is definitely based on a physical object. Now, of course, you may also want to say, well, no, the note is the way we interpret those sound waves. That's fine. But that sound wave is still delivered to you physically and your physical ear was necessary to translate that into any kind of signals for your brain to operate on. And those signals are, of course, physical processes. But here, So we're going to talk about perception and the experience of perception. So Harry Nicholas has left a comment. Funny thing about sound is it doesn't exist anywhere. And by that, I think he means neither in outer space nor in uh, an atmosphere. Color only exists inside your head. Objects and light have no intrinsic color. Think about how redshift works. But sound, the noise, doesn't even exist inside your head. Sound is a compression of a medium. It doesn't involve noise. Even your ears detect the waves. There is no noise other than in your imagination. The noise is a simulation. Well, I responded to that because I had some problems with that comment. There is no noise other than in your imagination, he says. The perception of sound waves occurs. That's physical. Our experience of that perception is that really different than the perception? I have no idea what an imagination is in this context. He says, Harry says, funny thing about sound is it doesn't exist anywhere. To me, this reads like a definition game. If sound is a category of waves, then it exists regardless of whether there is a physical organ to register the existence of those waves. I'm not saying sound exists. I'm saying it's all about definition. I'll expand a little bit and say what I just did here was with my definition, I defined sound into existence. And with Harry's definition, he, definition, he defined, defined sound out of existence. So we're getting nowhere fast here. I'll continue with my comment. And since definitions involve humans making choices, we're no longer talking about universal physical truths. But the waves we call sound have existed long before humans were around to make up definition games. So, these waves have been around since the beginning of the universe, approximately. And uh, we play definition games to define them into and out of existence when in fact they've always independently existed long before we were even specks of stardust. I don't see that there's much to be gained with that kind of approach to issues, uh, that kind of definition game approach to issues. And I just wanted to call Harry out on that. And that did get me thinking, you know, well, because I've heard other people express this idea that sounds don't sound doesn't really exist. Uh, can we really separate our experience of a perception from the perception? Is that really a valid thing to do when we're talking about our ears perceiving the compression of a medium and then we experience that perception 
of our ears. It's our own ear and our own experience. It's not some other person's ear in my attempt to interpret an experience from it. Can these really be separated meaningfully? Is there anything to be gained? I should think maybe if you're like a medical researcher and you're doing research on how hearing and brain functions work, by all then you want to break it down into as many parts as possible uh, in order to understand how each and every physical part, what role it plays in this process. But it's a unified process. The sound wave reaching your ear and then you experiencing the perception of your ear of that sound wave. There's no dividing line there. We can define arbitrarily a dividing line at anywhere we want, you know, but it's an arbitrary definition imposed by our selves, and it's not some kind of universal physical truth. We're going to look at one last piece of Pologia's video. It, we're going to see this pastor use definitions, play definition games, in order to skirt around issues that he doesn't want to face and in order to reinforce opinions that he can't really support otherwise. Now I want to make it clear again, I'm not going after religion here. That's not my point. My point is how do we formulate valid arguments? How do we have productive discussions? How do we recognize when people are using manipulative um, deceptive tech tactics. That's what this is really all about. And it's also about experience and perception. I had never really sat down and thought through this process of perceiving and experiencing the perception that these are, in a sense, two stages in a process, not just one thing, but also not uh, separable. Well, any, I, any thoughts you have from this video, I welcome your comments. Love to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, so leave a comment, leave a thumbs up if you enjoyed this. Do the subscribe number and all that if you haven't already. And I'll see you all again soon. Bye-bye. And there's a lot more I can go through, but the point is simple. If all the properties of the brain are physical and all the properties of the mind are non-physical, then consciousness, if it exists, cannot be physical. So Mr. Atheist, if consciousness... So again, you need to get these definitions now, Eric, what is a mind? Because you, my friend, are playing on your intuition of what a mind is and my intuition of what a mind is. But I'm guessing that your definition of a mind is everything that you would call non-physical about consciousness, all these abstractions. We didn't really get into nominalist abstractions. That's fine. Like a nominalist abstraction would be, for example, dogs is an abstraction, right? There, you would say, well, do dogs exist? Well animals exist that we would categorize as dogs based on your definition of a dog, but does the concept of dogs actually exist or is that merely just a description of objects that exist? And I'm definitely in that camp. So with the mind, what Eric is doing here is he's describing these thought events and the collection of thought events, which are not physical, but caused by the physical. And just waving his hand and saying that is the mind. And if you accept his definition of mind, then it's not physical. Don't do that. Exists and can't be physical. And if you have con And even if it is intuitively makes sense to you and you're of a dualist type, but it doesn't matter. It is not clear that this is the case. For m many people who do think about this deeply, this whole notion that Eric is getting into is not required. Perhaps it describes the truth. Perhaps not. It is definitely not clear that he's describing the truth. Just like decided to become an atheist then you shouldn't be an atheist because atheism can't be true. Ha ha ha. He came up with a joke, right? If you consciously decided to become an atheist, you can't be an atheist because he's defined consciousness as, as a non-physical thing. He's defined atheism in some weird way where that means not physical things exist. So boom, gotcha. Zinger. Checkmate atheists, as they say. What are you? You naturalist? You're, or, uh, you're a nominalist? Or you're a realist? Are you a naturalist? Are you a merely an atheist or you a believer in all these things let me know in the comments did my clarifications help there did it help see where eric was conflating ideas setting traps and having composition fallacies hopefully that helped if i made any mistakes let me know in the chat let me know in the comments please do go over to Pologia's channel if these are subjects that interest you i will put a link in the description have a great day everybody bye bye